But since there's a few new people here tonight, I would talk a few kind of basics about Zen and Buddhism and what we're doing here. And then um, we'll see where I go from there. Um, our teacher liked to say that Zen means two things, understanding yourself and helping this world. So, we say it's two things, but in many ways it's one thing with different faces. Same point, different faces. But this, this question of understanding yourself is actually quite important. Um, if you look at all the human suffering, I think if we investigate it, I know I have in my own life, both personally and Besides being a Zen teacher, I'm also a psychotherapist, so I get a unique sense of the human mind and, and where we human beings get stuck. And a lot of, we could say a lot of the problem is unconsciousness, of not really knowing who we are and not being able to truly express our own nature. One way I like to describe this um, would come from reading novels. When you read a novel, you'll, you'll often read the inner dialogue, um, what the person is actually feeling and thinking and what they're going through. And so you might read a section where the person is maybe struggling with something really difficult in their own life, and, or maybe relationships and friendships, and then one of their friends walks into the scene and you read this inner dialogue on how she really doesn't like that person, she's angry about something, she feels this, she feels that. And you can read a paragraph or sometimes pages full of background of what happened and all, all of the difficulties. And then you get one line of dialogue that says, Oh, how nice it is to see you tonight. She's lying. There's a whole backstory that doesn't get acknowledged. And in a novel, they give you the backstory. But in our own minds, in our own lives, we often don't understand the backstory. We don't know what's going on. We don't know why we feel what we feel. We don't understand what's going on and how is it that I keep getting into these messes. If we look at our own lives, we often see that there's a pattern to the things that give us difficulties. The same thing that I have a problem with with you, I also have a problem with this other person. Or you could say from the psychotherapeutic view, when, when somebody comes in and tells me about some situation, we'll often very quickly go back to what it was like in childhood, what it was like in family life, friendship life, different things that happen. And very quickly, it doesn't take very long to see a connection between the way I struggled in my family life, or in my school life, or, or with my friends, depending on the situation, it's, it's different. And then being able to understand, quite simply, how it is that I'm operating now. One of the lines that sometimes gets used in therapy is, as a child, we're struggling to manage things that we can't control. And we develop strategies to get through. And in some ways, these strategies are brilliant. Because, my apologies to the parents in the room, um, but you were also children once. Um, we're very often growing up in crazy situations. Our parents have been unconscious. People around us don't know who they are, are unclear about how their actions are impacting us and the people around us. 
So very quickly, from a very early age, we developed these strategies to manage the situation and to survive. And on one level, it's brilliant because we get through. We find our way through. But as adults, we keep doing the same thing. And what was brilliant and gets us through as a child often is exactly what gets into us into trouble as an adult. And very, very, very often we're unconscious of the whole process. We have no idea. So when we say Zen is about understanding myself, we're looking to see we we use the question, what am I? What is this thing that we call I? And it's, it may seem like just linguistics or, or language, but we're not really asking, who am I? We're asking, what am I? What is it? In Zen, we're trying to see things as they are, or you could say, as they have been. It's not so much about understanding it, it's about seeing it and experiencing it directly. I said earlier when, when I introduced the chanting that much of what chanting is about is non-rational. It's not irrational, it's non-rational. Last week in Dharma talk we were talking about before thinking mind. The mind that experiences something before the commentary sets in. Then we try to understand it. I had an experience, uh, it's almost a year ago, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try to avoid getting into the experience, but I ended up leaving a situation uncomfortable with what I had done and the way the situation had turned out. And I got picked up by a good friend of mine. This was, and we were driving, and I was kind of preoccupied with what had just happened. And what I watched was I didn't really understand what happened. And I started piecing it together. And at some point, I settled on a narrative about what happened. And then it was like, okay, now I understand. But looking at it, what I realized, I watched the process of a narrative getting created and then believing the narrative that I had just created. But there's a gap between the narrative that I create and what actually happened. As I'm not a scientist myself, but as I understand in talking to scientists, we have something simple called the scientific method, where the objective is to observe things as they are, not as we want them to be. Sounds simple, but it's actually quite complicated. And in my work with people and talking to scientists, I've been told how difficult that is, how bias so quickly and subtly comes into our observations that we can't even necessarily trust what it is we're seeing. And I suppose, getting a bit esoteric, there's one view that says once we observe something, we actually change the thing itself. So our observation already skews things. So what that leads us to in our Zen practice is the recognition of not knowing. For most of us, knowing is the way we use to find some security and some stability in our life. So as I gave in that example, once I settled on a narrative that made sense to me, I felt better. That's what we're doing all the time. We're, we're taking these things that we really don't understand. So much input is happening all the time. And we're struggling to keep up. 
And these days there's more and more and more information and things are more and more and more instantaneous. And in many ways we don't have the capacity to hold everything and understand everything. So our consciousness creates these schemas that we fit reality through to help us understand. But the schemes are made up. They're not true. So our sense of reality is always skewed. And then we believe things and then we defend them as if they're true and we end up having conflicts all over the place. So our Zen practice is set up to hit that, to break that schema down, to recognize the holes in our belief system. And if we can, in, in, in usual life, as soon as we see a hole in our belief system, we try to fill it up. We grab the caulking or the, 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 the cement and we jam it in there as tightly as we can so we can feel our schema as whole again. The Zen practitioner goes the other way. Once we find the hole, we try to look at it and open it and widen it. And in a sense, when we can open the whole of our schema, our true nature can come through. We can express what's naturally true, rather than a designed facade that we use to impress people. I'm getting into a lot more theory than I expected. But the point is that just what we did tonight, those 25 minutes of sitting, we're breathing in, and Paul taught us this very simple meditation instruction. Clear mind, clear mind, clear mind. We're breathing in, reminding ourselves to see things clearly. I don't know if Paul said it tonight, but he often says, a clear mind is like a clear mirror. Red comes, red appears. White comes, white appears. Just boom, perception. But often what happens as soon as the red appears, my opinions about red dominate my consciousness. What we're trying to do is before the opinions arise, to just see it, just hear it, just smell it, just taste it, to allow the natural just what it is to appear. It's very difficult. It sounds easy. But it takes a lot of work to strip away all of the commentary, all of the story, to be able to perceive this moment. And then Paul told us, we breathe out, don't know. That don't know mind is our best friend. We don't know it. We think it's our worst enemy. But it's actually our best friend. Because when we drop into not knowing, we become like that scientist who looks who wonders, who investigates, rather than continuing to do the same crazy behavior over and over and over again. <coughs> Insanity has been described as doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. But not knowing lets us check it out, lets us be curious, lets us wonder lets us actually connect with what's happening rather than separating ourselves by what we know. So, I said this first part of practice is investigating what am I? What is this life? And we keep that mind always and everywhere. The second part of it is helping the world, connecting to what is happening right now and responding. In the readings we were using during our retreat last week, the Sixth Patriarch, who's a very famous person in the Zen world from 700s, 600s, something like that, he said, absorption in action is what he called samadhi, 
Samadhi is like this deep connection to the moment. If when we're walking, we feel our foot on the ground, we're connected to the moment. Usually we're walking and we're thinking about all sorts of other things. We're dwelling in some story, something that happened to us that we didn't like or something that we really want and we're trying to figure out how to get it. All these dramas of our life, we're stuck running the stories about them. And as I was saying, when we run those stories, we miss what's happening in the moment. If we can connect with, happen with, with what is happening in the moment, what we often see is a need. We see the pain of ourselves, the pain of others, the simple need to lift, hand something to someone. Somebody's grab, reaching for something, but they can't get it. If we're so busy in our own story, in our drama, we can't even see what's happening. Or we start to create a lot of stories about that other person, and we lose the moment. But if we could just simply connect with what is, then when something is needed to be done, we can do it. So my teacher used to say, when you do something, do it. 100%. Think of yourself. Think of all the things you do half-heartedly. Think of all the ways that we're kind of doing it, but we're torn. We have these words in our language. We feel split. We feel torn. I want one thing, but I do something else. Zen practice is trying to bring that together. So we say when you're doing something, do it. And if you can keep your heart open, and we're not so fixated on I, my, me, then we can perceive the world around us. Then the simple need that appears, we can respond to. So the more we understand ourselves, the more we can let go of ourselves. The more we can get out of our self-centeredness, self-centeredness, the more we're able to respond to the needs around us. A Japanese, famous, actually pivotal Japanese Zen master from the 1200s, Dogen, said something that stays with us in our practice even today. To study Buddhism is to study the self. That's what I was saying when I was talking about what am I? We investigate. We're curious about ourselves, our actions, our behaviors, our desires, our needs, all of it. Not in a judgmental way, not in a self-critical way, but in an open, investigative way. So to study Buddhism is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. Once we study ourselves, what we find, and it maybe seems counterintuitive, rather than it become a fixation about ourselves, we can let go of our self-centeredness. We see its origins. We perceive how it manifests, and we can naturally let go. To study Buddhism is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be enlightened by all things. If we can forget the self, not be so stuck in our self-centered behavior, then we can actually connect with the moment. And when we connect with the moment, that's what's called being enlightened by all things. When we're drinking something, we can actually taste it. When we're feeling something, we can actually feel it. When we notice something, we can see it. When our heart is open, we can respond to it. Our hearts close down when we're stuck in our self-centered behavior. Our hearts open up when we take in others. But there's one more important point, and I'm sure Paul touched on this in the meditation instruction tonight. 
to be able to forget the self, to be able to investigate the self, we have to develop some strength, some courage, some stability in our own body and mind. So, I didn't hear all the instructions tonight, but I'm sure Paul talked about breathing into your lower abdomen. Slowly breathing into your lower abdomen, filling your belly so that on your inhalation your belly rises and on your exhalation it falls. And what we're doing here is creating a strong foundation. It's only with feeling stable enough <clears throat> do we actually have the capacity to let go of the things that we've grabbed onto for support. So, we have to develop, in the Japanese tradition, they call it the hara, or the center. In the Korean and Chinese tradition, they call it the tanjen. Tanjen literally, literally translates energy garden. With each breath, we're watering our energy garden. And our, I remember my teacher's Master Sung San, that guy whose picture's on the wall there, he used to, with a stick, he used to poke us in interviews. He'd poke us right there, about an inch and a half, two inches below the navel. And he'd say, make your center stronger, stronger, stronger. By making our center stronger, we develop the capacity to be with things as they are. When we're weak in the center, we have to fall into story, and belief to protect ourselves. If our center is strong, we can be open. We can handle what's coming our way because we have some stability and some strength in that center. So, if we can both focus on this great question, what am I, observe, not think about, not perseverate about, just observe. If you get one thing from this talk that you take out with you, it's observe your life. Not, again, not in a self-critical or self-doubting way, but in an open, curious inquiry. What is this? What am I? And watch. And keep watching. And dig a little deeper. Once you think you understand something, ask again. Really? Is that really so? Challenge your assumptions. Challenge your beliefs. Challenge what you think is so, so you can open to what is. And with that open-mindedness, then if you, you see a need, do it. Connect with the world that you're living in. If we all can simply get out of the, the stuckness of our own I, my, me, then we can help the world. We can do something in small ways. You know, we talk about world peace and we're wanting something, but usually we think it's some power out there that's going to make it happen. And the Zen perspective is that it's us who make it happen. That in the very way that we live our lives and connect with the daily, the daily hubbub of existence, we create the peace that we're looking for in our behavior and actions in our life. It's not somebody else's job, it's our job. And Zen practice gives us a way to clarify our minds, to open our hearts, to be able to just do it in the moment that we find ourselves in. Question? Comment? Anything everybody wants to talk about? Anything that I might have stimulated? Or any question about your life? Anything at all is fine. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is rooted in a series of personal experiences. Uh, we talk about uh, letting go of our explanations, of our stories, of our prejudices. 
But what I have found is that there is a limit in my personal strength uh, beyond which I become too unstable to the point where I can like hurt somebody or hurt myself. Uh, uh, the I'll just stop you a second. I just want to highlight what you just said because I think it really connects with what I was talking about. It's like we reach a point where we're too stretched and suddenly I can't do it anymore and then you said and then I may hurt somebody. Then we lose, we lose ourselves and then we start striking out or doing things to try to build that capacity up again. I think that's very interesting the way you said it. So, go ahead. Yeah, so one of my experiences was that I was feeling very strongly about something and I was acting not very nicely about something. And I actually had that experience how over several weeks my theory about why I was doing that solidified. At first I knew my theory was bogus, but by the end of it I kind of uh, yielded to the pressure to believe in the theory and to present it to the world. Mm -hmm. And that actually helped me. If I did not do that, then I could have run into some serious trouble. So my question is, uh, how do we know what our actual stretching limit is? And at what point is it okay to say, okay, I cannot handle this, I'm gonna do it the old way, just so that I can function and not mm -hmm. basically fall apart? Well, that first question is, how do we know what our stretch limit is? By experience. You wouldn't have known it until you hit it. That you were able to see where the edge was, was a good thing. So, we only learn things by experience. There's no manual that tells you, you will hit it at a certain time. You have to find out for yourself, because yours is different than Chris's. This is different than Paul's. It's different than Sharon's. Every one of us has a different life. So you have to find out for yourself. All of us have to find out where is that place that we crack. And then is it okay to act on the old story? This isn't about, it's not about good or bad or judgment. We do what we have to do. The most important thing is to learn from the experience. You seem to understand what happened, you have a view of it. That teaches you, not me. Your experience teaches you. Was it okay or not? How did it work? It helped you then, but you must also see that there were limitations to it. You have to use your own experience and learn from that experience. Use your questioning, observing, not knowing, not mind, and discover it for yourself. Bring that to interview. Let's talk about that after you've learned from your experience. Okay? It's not, there's no formula. You have to find it for yourself. Thank you. Anybody else? Question or comment? Please. Is that possible to follow that Zen way um, by ourselves, or is a teacher is necessary? It's often said that a teacher is necessary to follow the Zen way. The trouble with doing it without a teacher, or maybe even more than just a teacher, without a community, is that it's very easy for us to get fixated in our own belief system. To practice Zen, you've got to bump up against something. To see your, the walls of yourself, you have to hit them. And too often, if we're just, if we're just making the, the, making, doing it all ourselves, we don't know how to find those edges. So I often say that I think it's very important to have aspects of practice that we don't like. Because if we set things up just by ourselves, we'll usually set it up to what makes us feel good. And it's very nice to feel good. But that cushioning can also help us fall asleep. 
So we need, we need a way to push up against those edges. And a community or a teacher is one of those ways. So that by practicing in a, with a group, whether you show up every week or once a year, to have that community and also that teacher to be able to listen and reflect something back to you. You know, to work with a teacher, probably the most important thing is to be vulnerable. To be able to express those difficult places and to stay open to feedback. Very often people come in to see me and really all they want to do is tell me what they know. You'd be surprised, I have people come in to talk to me and they tell me about Zen. <laughs> to really get something out of a teacher, you have to be open. You have to trust them enough to be able to listen. You don't have to agree with them. It's not about that. But you have to be open enough to present what's difficult and to listen to the feedback. So that's a very valuable thing. And Many of us, and I know coming up in Zen practice, I had to work with that. With Zen Master Sung Son, it was easy. With some of the American teachers who he had made teachers, it was more difficult because I felt more competitive. I wanted their approval. I could be critical of them. And looking back, I can see how that was just the reflection of my own psychology. It really wasn't about them at all. So, just to encourage that process of being vulnerable, being, in a way, having enough strength in your center that you can be vulnerable and let in what somebody else has to say. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say that um, I, for the person who just asked that question or anyone else, I spent years of mostly just meditating on my own. I'm a single parent, and so I couldn't get to a community. So I would listen to teachings, I would watch teachings, I would read teachings. I would try to sit on my own, and then finally, <laughs> I actually started coming here, and um, I, I want to just say, in addition to what our Zen master said, the, the power, the support of the community for practice, the support of a teacher for practice is uh, when it's in person, not in a CD or a tape or a DVD or in a book, is 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 profound um, and, and is life changing. And I will say this community is particularly warm and kind and welcoming. And mm -hmm. I'm very grateful to be part of it. This all thank you. Mm. This many different things serve many different purposes. Like this talk's going to go up on the internet and. I, I often travel around and give talks, and it's not that infrequent that somebody at the talk comes to me and says, wow, I've been listening to your talks on, on the internet, and thank you so much, they're really helpful. So there's a, there's a value to that, but then what Miriam is talking about is something a little bit different. It's the power of community and face-to-face -face interaction that helps us learn about ourselves and supports us to be able to do the work. So someone like the Dalai Lama is this incredible resource. But for most of us, that's not enough. We have to do the work in the flesh with other people, with that live interaction with community and with teachers. So there's a saying that everybody is a Buddha, they just don't know it. Even Donald Trump. Especially. Or <laughs> that acquaintance that you just can't stand. Yeah. So what's, what's that getting at? What's what? What is that getting at? Well, it was the sixth patriarch who said, we just read it last week, he said, the only difference between an enlightened person and an unenlightened person is that the enlightened person realizes it. We all have the same self-nature. 
We all already have it. It's our birthright. Just being born is enough. But as I was saying at the beginning of the talk, we get caught in all the ways that we structure our personalities and our psychology to pr protect ourselves, and we mistake that for who we are. So everybody has this original true nature, but more and more we lose contact with it. You know the phrase, I'm, losing, I'm out of touch with myself. Or sometimes you'll say, it's amazing, I don't do that, right after we just did it. We disconnect. Everybody already has it, we're already complete, we're already good enough. The challenge is to drop into that place and, and in a sense to get out of our own way so that we can actually express who we already are. So Zen practice is not about getting something and then I'll be it. It's really about moving things out of the way so I can already be what I already am. That's the challenge. It's not to be somebody else, it's to truly be ourselves. And each of us manifests through the conditions of our own life. So we can use the situations, we can actually use the personality that we've created to express that true nature, if we can break through the grip of it. It's not like we have to become somebody else just have to find a way, like I said, to open those holes enough to let our true nature come through. And that manifests through who we already are. Don't have to become somebody different. Chris, just a kind of comment maybe leading to a question. So um, when I first started practicing with you know, someone in the Northern California, different school, not a, not a probably famous person, but it was very interesting, very talented, brilliant person, but I think ethical problems. And at some point, that was damaging to me and to my family, and we broke off. And later on, that saga kind of blew up over sort of related activities or whatever. And, um, but it was still, for me, positive and learned a lot and useful. Mm -hmm. to, to have that experience and, and it wasn't, you know, and some of it was painful and, and it brought up the kind of question I would argue with my wife at the time, you know, discuss and say, you know, you have the Zen master, you're supposed to do what they say and I say, well, there's a certain point and something comes up and that's no, you know, and, I, and I'm going to say no, so oh, but you're supposed to say yes, no. <laughs> and it was very interesting because she also came to the point to say no. And it was, it was interesting and useful for both of us mm -hmm. and, you know, both that dilemma and going through that experience, I think over the larger picture was very positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any situation we can learn from. And be careful. I mean, as you said, whatever, whoever, whatever that sangha was, there can be a lot of damage along the way. But it gets very dangerous, I think, this whole idea. And it's, it's, I guess it is in Zen, although not so much here. Um, but in some traditions, it's like, you know, in India, I was reading this article where you can never challenge the guru. I mean, that's the kind of thing. It's this guru worship kind of thing. And I think very often that leads to abuse. So there's a way to respectfully question. And if the community is set up in such a way where it's okay to do that, then it doesn't have to be a big deal. You don't have to wait until it's finally gotten the point where I can't say yes. You know, you're asking me to kill somebody and I won't do that. I'm obviously being extreme. 
it's better if the community is set up where if you've got something to say, you can say it. And you, nobody is omniscient. They say the Buddha was, but I hardly even believe that. And if he was, it doesn't help us that much. Because most everybody else we meet in our lives is not. So if you give someone too much power and belief in their omniscience, you're probably going to get hurt in the end. It's, it seems to me we're better off than just being humble. We're all on this path together. Nobody gets everything right all the time. And to just stay open and to learn from each other is a much healthier course. Yeah, so I said the student needs to be vulnerable with the teacher, but the teacher also needs to be vulnerable and authentic and real. So I would suggest whether it's here or any other, really it doesn't even matter, it doesn't even have to be a Buddhist song, it could be anywhere. When you're looking at authority, to look for humbleness, look for authenticity, look for admitting mistakes, that goes a long way. That's my personal view. Any last question or comment before we end? Okay, thank you all very much.